SpaceX Starship is having more issues than we initially expected. One of the newly discovered problems is with the reaction control system, which failed to stabilize the ship during flight. Fortunately, a new solution has recently been proposed, and it's not just a fix for this issue. It could also provide a huge boost for future milestones, like orbital refueling and even missions to Mars. So, let's take a closer look at what this solution is and why it could be such a game changer. Reaction Control Systems, RCS, are essential to spacecraft propulsion, providing precise control over a vehicle's orientation and trajectory. These systems are designed to deliver small but accurate bursts of thrust in any direction, allowing for fine-tuned adjustments during flight. RCS thrusters also generate torque, enabling the spacecraft to rotate along its axis for attitude control. A typical RCS setup includes a combination of larger and smaller thrusters to offer both coarse and fine maneuvering capabilities, depending on the mission's needs. The design and reliability of an RCS are critical to the overall success and safety of any space mission. The Starship prototypes up to and including SN15 used cold gas nitrogen thrusters. These systems generate thrust by releasing compressed gas, typically nitrogen or helium, through nozzles. Cold gas thrusters are simple, reliable, and relatively inexpensive, making them ideal for small spacecraft or attitude control. However, they offer limited performance with a specific impulse, typically ranging from 50 to 70 seconds. During a 2021 Starbase tour with Tim Dodd the Everyday Astronaut, Elon Musk revealed that Super Heavy would use ullage gas thrusters, while Starship would be equipped with Methalox hot gas thrusters. When Tim asked why Starship wouldn't also use ullage gas thrusters, Elon began to explain why it did not make sense. Then, mid-sentence, he reconsidered and admitted it actually did make sense. Interestingly, after that interview, the Methalox thrusters were never seen again and were not mentioned in any official updates. Shortly afterward, noticeable changes were observed in the location and shape of ullage vents on both Super Heavy and Starship. This strongly suggests that both vehicles now use ullage gas thrusters. This approach is not without precedent. In fact, Elon Musk has stated that SpaceX uses the passivization vent on the Falcon 9 upper stage to help reorient the vehicle for disposal. By rotating the stage into the desired orientation before venting, the escaping gas acts much like a cold gas thruster. There is no combustion, just pressure-driven thrust from a valve opening. Despite being described as cold gas, the gas is not necessarily cold. For eelage thrusters, it is actually preferable for the gas to be as hot as possible without compromising the structural integrity of the tank. Higher temperatures mean higher pressure and more effective thrust. So, while the gas is hot, this system should not be confused with true hot gas thrusters, which we will cover later. While the current RCS thrusters on Starship offer the advantage of being relatively simple and familiar to SpaceX, which allows engineers to focus on more complex systems, they also have significant drawbacks, as demonstrated during the vehicle's ninth flight. In that mission, a propellant leak led to a loss of main tank pressure during the coast and re-entry phases. As a result, the tanks could not maintain sufficient pressure, which in turn crippled the attitude control system. Without adequate control authority, Starship was unable to maintain proper orientation and was ultimately lost. A clear solution might be to switch to a different type of RCS thruster or to supplement the current system with one that operates independently of the main propellant tanks. Remember when I mentioned a system called a hot gas thruster? This was an idea SpaceX had early on for Starship, and they actually conducted some tests with it. A hot gas thruster is essentially a small rocket engine that burns either a monopropellant or a bipropellant in a combustion chamber to produce thrust. The performance is significantly better than cold gas systems, with specific impulse reaching around 300 seconds, which is considered high-end for RCS applications. The concept for Starship's hot gas thrusters would leverage SpaceX's expertise with the Raptor engine by using the same methane and oxygen propellants, though in high-pressure, gaseous form. If implemented correctly, such a system could deliver roughly five times the efficiency and thrust of a similarly-sized cold gas thruster. 
making it ideal for maneuvering and controlling massive 100 to 250 ton spacecraft and boosters in orbit. Of course, this system is not as easy to integrate as the current Starship RCS. To support hot gas thrusters, you would need a separate high-pressure propulsion setup, including dedicated fuel and oxidizer tanks. For test flights, these would likely be housed in standalone tanks. However, the potential advantages of this system are hard to ignore. First, it does not rely on the main tank's pressure to function. This means that if a leak occurs again, the ship could still retain some attitude control, offering a better chance of recovery. The high efficiency compared to other systems means less fuel is required for maneuvering, and the significantly higher thrust of hot gas thrusters makes them far more effective than nitrogen-based systems, especially for orbital maneuvers and stabilizing the vehicle during high wind landings. This system would also be a major asset for orbital refueling operations, where two starships must autonomously dock while orbiting a few hundred miles above Earth. These maneuvers are highly complex. As Elon Musk put it, this is similar to aerial refueling for airplanes, but in this case, it's orbital refilling of rockets, which has never been done before. Another system known for its high efficiency and thrust is the hypergolic fed engine, which uses a combination of propellants that spontaneously ignite upon contact. The key advantages of hypergolic propellants are that they can be stored as liquids at room temperature, and engines using them are easy to ignite reliably and repeatedly. While some large hypergolic engines in launch vehicles use turbo pumps, most are pressure-fed systems. In these systems, an inert gas such as helium pressurizes the propellant tanks, feeding fuel and oxidizer through valves into the combustion chamber. Their immediate ignition upon contact helps prevent the dangerous accumulation of unreacted propellants, which could lead to catastrophic ignition events. Hypergolic engines do not require an external ignition system and can be fired multiple times simply by opening and closing the valves. This makes them especially useful for precise spacecraft maneuvers. Another benefit is their high propellant density compared to cryogenic fuels which is particularly valuable in deep space missions. Smaller tanks mean smaller spacecraft, which helps reduce payload fairing requirements. SpaceX currently uses hypergolic-fed engines in the launch escape system of the Dragon spacecraft and has significant experience operating them. However, traditional hypergolic propellants are highly corrosive, toxic, and carcinogenic, which requires costly safety procedures for handling and storage. More critically, there are limitations that make hypergolic systems less suitable for Starship compared to hot gas thrusters. As mentioned earlier, hot gas thrusters can use the same propellants as the Raptor engines, methane and oxygen, which simplifies the overall system. This becomes a major advantage for future Mars missions. Once on Mars, RCS thrusters are not needed for flip maneuvers, but are essential for general attitude control, orbital adjustments, and re-entry stability. Using nitrogen or hypergolic propellants introduces the problem of requiring additional fuel types that are not readily available on Mars. Hypergolics, in particular, are dangerous to handle and complicate post-landing operations. They also cannot be refueled in space or on Mars. In contrast, methane-oxygen hot gas thrusters can recharge their gas tanks through vaporization of cryogenic propellants already on board. Since Starship is designed to be refueled on Mars using in-situ resource utilization, ISRU, Relying on methane and oxygen makes the system far more sustainable. Mars lacks both nitrogen and complex chemicals like hypergolics, as well as helium, which is commonly used in pressurization systems. Therefore, Starship's long-term design aims to depend only on resources that can realistically be manufactured on Mars within the next 30 years. By the way, the lunar version of Starship, known as the Human Landing System, HLS, also includes additional engines near the top of the spacecraft. When the vehicle is within approximately 100 meters of the lunar surface, it is designed to switch from using the main Raptor engines to a set of high-thrust landing engines located in the mid-body section. 
This approach is intentional, as firing the main raptors close to the moon's surface would kick up large amounts of lunar regolith, which could damage the spacecraft or surrounding systems. Instead of using liquid oxygen and methane like the raptors, these landing engines burn gaseous oxygen and methane. SpaceX is currently developing these engines specifically for the lunar landing scenario. However, the primary goal at this stage is simply to have a fully functional Starship HLS. That also means ensuring a standalone Starship vehicle is capable of flying and operating reliably. The thing is, at this stage, there is growing concern that Starship HLS might not be ready in time for Artemis III, the mission planned to return astronauts to the moon. If delays continue, there is a real possibility that China could become the first nation to land astronauts on the moon in the 21st century. As a result, alternative options are being considered, including Blue Origin's lunar lander, known as Blue Moon. Blue Origin is developing two versions of Blue Moon. The first is a robotic lander, initially scheduled to land on the moon in 2024, but now delayed to 2025. The second is a larger human-rated version designed to carry a crew of four astronauts. This crewed variant is currently planned to support NASA's Artemis V mission, which is targeting a lunar landing in 2030. So the first version of Blue Origin's lunar lander is called Blue Moon Mark I, and it's a fully autonomous vehicle designed to deliver cargo to the moon's surface. It runs on a single BE-7 engine, and while it's not huge, about 8.05 meters tall and 3.08 meters wide, it can still carry up to 3,000 kilograms of payload. Now, just to be clear, this version isn't meant to carry humans. Instead, it's built for things like delivering lunar rovers or setting up a kind of base station on the moon, something that can provide power and communications for other missions. The main goal of the Mark I is to test key systems including flight computers, avionics, reaction control, and power systems, which will also be used on the crewed version, called Mark II. Speaking of that, Blue Moon Mark II is the version designed to carry people. It will take up to four astronauts to the moon for missions lasting up to 30 days, starting with NASA's Artemis V mission, which is currently scheduled for 2030. But before we get to that, there's an uncrewed test flight planned for 2027 to make sure everything works properly. That includes the lander's life support systems and its ability to return to near-rectilinear halo orbit after leaving the lunar surface. There's also a cargo variant in development. That one is meant to carry even heavier loads, up to 20,000 kilograms to the moon in a reusable setup, or 30,000 kilograms if it's a one-way trip. Right now, the first Mark I is being put together at Blue Origins facility in Florida, with a launch expected in the next few months. A second Mark I is already in the works and is about six to eight months behind the first. The idea is that if the first mission doesn't go exactly as planned, Blue Origin can learn from what worked and what didn't and apply those lessons to the next one. One of the cool technologies they're developing is something called zero boil-off storage. It helps keep cryogenic propellants like liquid hydrogen at 20 kelvins and liquid oxygen at 90 kelvins super cold so they don't evaporate over time. They've already tested an early prototype in a thermal vacuum chamber, which is a promising sign. As for launching the lander, the plan is to use New Glenn, Blue Origin's heavy lift rocket. It has only flown once so far, and they're still working on getting booster recovery right. That said, there are other options on the table. SpaceX's Starship, for example, has been showing a lot of promise. I actually talked more about that in another video, so feel free to check that out if you're interested.